Hi, nice to be back with you. So far this course, we've been spending most of our time in the classical world. I would call it the classical world, though it's actually been several classical worlds. We've examined the world of classical India, classical China, the classical Semitic world, and the classical Greek world. In what comes up next, after this lecture, we'll be inhabiting modernity, primarily, but not exclusively, European modernity. And so, as we hit this nice juncture point, where we're moving from the classical to the modern, it's probably a good time to take stock and see where we are so far, see what questions remain, and anticipate some of the differences between the texts and the ideas that we've been examining thus far and those that we're going to be examining in the remainder of the course. Now, one thing that I want to point out at this point, and this is probably obvious to you, while we promised to ask the question, what is the meaning of life? and to show that it could be asked in a serious, deep, thoughtful, and well-reasoned way. And while I promised that we would see answers, plural, to the question, what is it to lead a meaningful life, I never promised you a kind of unanimity or a clear single answer to that question. And so, though we've seen many answers, we have not seen a single answer. We have found that so far, we have encountered no real unanimity in an approach to understanding the meaning of life. Some of the texts that we have read have been clearly oriented to finding the meaning of life in our relationship to the divine. Examples of those would be the Bhagavad Gita, where the meaningful life was a life literally lived in union with Krishna, where Krishna was the embodiment of divinity. Another example, of course, would be Job, where it's our orientation to God, and in fact, our release of an expectation that God is somehow organizing the universe around us that leads to the possibility of finding meaning in a life which might otherwise be meaningless. Marcus Aurelius, though he didn't spend a lot of time thinking about divinity, was clearly working in a Stoic tradition, and that's a tradition in which the entire universe is permeated by this kind of divine rationality that comes from its divine creator, Zeus, and where we need to think about the meaning of our lives partly in terms of cultivating the rationality that we share with the divinity and putting aside the passions that would never afflict the divinity. So even though you might say there's nothing at all in common with the vision of union that we see in the Bhagavad Gita, um, the vision of kind of solitude and distance that we find in Job and the idea of careful emulation that we find in Stoic philosophy, all three of these are unified by thinking that finding the meaning of life requires understanding our orientation with respect to divinity. Now, others that we've looked at try to find the meaning of life in a very mundane context. And again, even though we're going to see a difference in orientation here to those that I've just mentioned, we're not going to find unanimity among them. For instance, Aristotle argued that a meaningful life, a life of happiness, is a life lived in this kind of careful cultivation of individual virtues in a social context. And indeed required things like friendship, material goods, moral strength, and all of the other kinds of dimensions of eudaimonia, of flourishing. Confucius, we saw in a very different Chinese context, shares with Aristotle the idea that the meaning of life is effectively a mundane idea, but focuses primarily on things like ritual and filial piety, propriety, virtue, and our very particular social context the roles that we play in our societies. Taoists and Buddhists alike strive to find the meaning of life in a very mundane world. But in each of those cases, that mundane world is understood as interfused with a kind of ultimate reality, the Tao in the case of the, of the Taoists, and emptiness, this kind of interdependence in the case of the Buddhists. But in each of those cases, our orientation is very much to the way ordinary things are, not to some divinity who controls them, but rather to a deeper fundamental nature of reality, 
unlike what we might call the manifest nature of reality that plays such an important role for Aristotle and Confucius. Some of the people who we've examined and the texts we've examined see the meaning of life as fundamentally concerned with what is permanent, what is stable, as opposed to what is ephemeral. The Bhagavad Gita is really clear about that. When Arjuna is admonished by Krishna not to pay attention to things that come and go, not to pay attention to the temporal, but to pay attention to what's permanent, to what's essential in the universe. And the divinity is important primarily because of its stability and permanence, as opposed to warriors who are born and die and pass away and so forth. Job advises us to pay attention to what's permanent as well. Um, in this case, a very different kind of permanence, right? But still, to let go of what's temporary, to notice that life itself isn't such an important thing, that the important things are the, the world, the structure of reality in the context of which we lead our lives. Confucius, though you might not have noticed it so much, places a great emphasis on this idea of Qian, of heaven, and the respects in which our ordinary social lives, and hence our individual lives, gain their order by being in harmony with this overarching order of the heavens, this overarching order of the universe. And of course, for the Taoists, this whole idea of the way the universe is, as opposed to individual ways that we might take up with it, plays a very deep and important role. On the other hand, some of the texts that we've examined find the meaning of life not in connection to the permanent, but rather specifically in connection to the ephemeral and in, ex and in an acceptance of the importance of the ephemeral, the universality of ephemerality, and beauty in the context of the ephemeral. And of course, the most obvious examples of that would be Marcus Aurelius, who directs our attention to the beauty in, in the aged lion, the beauty in flowers that are about to fall, the beauty in figs that are overripe, and so forth. But also the Buddhists. We saw that the Buddha himself, Shantideva, but also Dogen really emphasized that everything around us, everything without exception, including ourselves, are conditioned by impermanence and are, in the end, ephemeral. Not just over a long period of time, as, say, Marcus Aurelius was emphasizing, but moment-to-moment -moment ephemerality, that we are constantly changing, and that if we are to find meaning in our lives, it's to find meaning not in something permanent beyond the impermanent, but to find meaning in the impermanent itself and in its impermanence. Some of the people who we've read have emphasized careful cultivation and socialization, that we need to work on ourselves, that we are at best raw material, raw material that needs to be cultivated, cut, polished, round, built up, perfected. We see this in Aristotle, who of course sees children as fairly rough material that need, who need to be brought up properly, who need friends and who need parents to cultivate virtue in them, moral wisdom, practical wisdom, moral strength, and so forth. We certainly see this in Confucius, of course. The metaphors are all Confucian. That it's social cultivation, the development of propriety, the development of an appreciation for the classics, the development of an understanding of our social roles that makes our lives worth living in the first place. And of course, Shantideva, in his exposition of the Bodhisattva path and the cultivation of the six Bodhisattva perfections, each of which requires strenuous, arduous work in self in self-perfection, with an enormous amount of mindfulness to that, is another example of somebody who believes that finding the meaning of life amounts to a careful construction and cultivation of a higher self. But others have argued that cultivation is precisely the problem, and that the meaning for li of life, and that the meaning of life, is to be found in getting rid of all that cultivation, getting past it, shedding it paring it away and returning to nature, to returning to our natural selves. We've seen that articulated very forcefully in the Tao Te Ching and in the Zhuangzi, but also 
in the work of Zen philosophers, particularly Dogen, each of whom argues that it's our social and conceptual accretions that get in the way of our leading a meaningful life. They don't facilitate it. Now, all of these are dimensions of divergence that we've encountered. And it's also worth recognizing that these dimensions cross-cut. Um, there are some people who, for instance, might orient to the divine and the permanent, others to the impermanent. Some might orient to the social and to the, and, and to the transcendent and so forth. These all cross-cut. But more importantly and more interestingly, and this might have been a surprise to you, there's no clean east-west divide here. It's not as though we say, ah, the wisdom traditions of Asia direct us to the transcendent and the permanent, and the kind of pragmatic traditions of the West focus on the ephemeral and the mundane. Each of these distinctions, each of these debates, finds itself echoed in Asia and in the West. And I'm hoping that's one of the things that's worth learning from comparing all of these texts and putting them together. When human beings ask about the meaning of life, all of the range of alternatives seem to crop up in almost every culture we imagine. So the first thing we notice is this enormous plurality and that it's a messy plurality. There's a lot of thought that has proceeded on this question, a lot of answers, and so far, at least in the classical world, nothing that could count as unanimity, though plenty of insight to be gleaned. On the other hand, there are a cluster of common dimensions to the answers that we've seen. And it's worth paying attention not only to the diversity, but also to places where we find some consensus. For one thing, as I anticipated at the very beginning of this course, everybody we've encountered who addresses the question, what is the meaning of life, or how can I lead a meaningful life, addresses that question in terms of our own relationship to some much larger context. That's not surprising. You'll remember when we talked at the very beginning about the various meanings of the word meaning, we saw that what each of the three of them had in common was a reference to something beyond. And so there's no surprise there. Almost everybody we've examined emphasizes a social dimension to a meaningful life, that somehow what makes our lives meaningful are our relationships to others and our roles in society and our fulfillment of those roles and contributing to the welfare of others, certainly most of them. Everybody we've examined recognizes that the problem of the meaning of life is initially posed by our finitude. Almost everybody we've examined pays attention to the fact that we are born and die a very short time later. We've seen that in the Gita with Krishna admonishing Arjuna that the people he confronts and who he's worried about killing are born and they die regardless of what we do and that lives have to be thought of as meaningful even though finite. Job reminds us that, you know, a human being is born up and cut down and forgotten and this all happens in a flash. Shantideva really emphasizes this constant life in the jaws of death. All of these people are emphasizing our own finitude and the problem of death. You might not have thought about it um, before, thinking, before reading these texts, but everybody who worries about finding our lives meaningful and what it is to find a life meaningful argues that you first have to take the problem of death seriously, that we can't understand our lives as meaningful unless we face death and understand the centrality of death to our lives. Without coming to terms with that reality, there's no way that we can lead an authentic life, no way that we can lead a meaningful life. And some of the folks we've read, especially the Buddhists, argue that it's the very suppression of a taking seriously of, of our death that leads to the shallowness, that leads to the shallowness and the meaninglessness of inauthentic lives. The other thing that might have been surprising is that almost everybody we've examined, almost every text we've read, has emphasized the importance of achieving spontaneity in some sense. And this I've put before as the idea that the good life is the virtuoso life, a life in which we lead a spontaneous, effortless kind of existence, not a studied, calculated existence. Let's begin with this idea that the larger context um, is always important. In some texts, like say the Bhagavad Gita, 
we find the idea that our life gets its meaning precisely be through, precisely through our comprehension of the divinity of the cosmos, our comprehension of our own divinity, and of our union with that kind of divine cosmos. So this is a context that's a kind of cosmic context. And Job suggests that we understand our lives as meaningful when we accept the incomprehensibility and the transcendence of the divine and the fact that we lead our lives as finite beings in the context of this incomprehensible cosmos. Um, the Taoists and Confucians also adopt this cosmic sense of context in very different ways, one through positive cultivation, one through pairing away. Each argues that the meaningful life is one that is led in harmony with a cosmic order properly understood. And the Stoics, too, argued that it's our rationality that enables us to harmonize with the rational divine, with the rational cosmic order. So in all of these traditions, we find a kind of cosmic dimension as essential to making sense of our lives. But these traditions also emphasize, other traditions also emphasize a social dimension as the larger context um, that's important in the meaning of life. Aristotle argued that the virtuous life is the life of a citizen. And when Aristotle examines his virtues, they are virtues like generosity, friendliness, courage, magnanimity, and so forth, that are all virtues that are manifested in a social context, virtues that are cultivated in a social context, virtues of friendship that involve connection to those who share our social context. So for Aristotle, the context that makes life meaningful, that makes happiness possible, the context that makes it possible for a human being to flourish in the full sense, it's not a cosmic context. It's a social context. It's the context of the polis. The Stoics, of course, shared this sense of the social role as the important role in determining the meaning of life. We saw so much emphasis in Seneca and in Marcus Aurelius on the development of kindness, patience, good interpersonal relations, and a sense of what we owe to others as what makes our lives meaningful. And Marcus Aurelius in his meditations is so eloquent about that. For the Confucians, of course, social role is everything. I mean, the mandate of heaven is important, and we've stressed that. But when we pay attention to the details, it's the family, it's filial piety, it's warm-heartedness and humanness. These two twin virtues of Ren and Li, of warm-heartedness and propriety, each of which is manifested in concrete social relations, each of which is particular the social relations in which a particular individual follows. So for all of these, it's the social context that provides the larger context. Buddhism gives us a slightly different vision, of course. For Buddhism, the context in which our lives become meaningful is the context of samsara, a world that we share of suffering, um, and a world that's constituted by these three levels of suffering, the suffering of ordinary pain, the suffering of change, and the suffering of pervasive uh, conditioning. And that is both social and cosmic. The problem is set by this ubiquity of suffering, and it's both set further by the fact that we're so, so totally interdependent. The solution is found in the problem itself. The insight of that interdependence, the insight into interdependence gives us the possibility of the development of compassion, and that forces us to think of ourselves as having a role and a commitment and a responsibility to the universe as a whole. So we get this very complicated dialectic between the social and the cosmic in Buddhism. Second big area of unanimity that we examine, which again has its diversity within it, is this emphasis on the, on the importance of finitude. In the Bhagavad Gita, we saw that it's our finite natures, it's our limitedness, that generates the kinds of attachment and the kinds of relationship to things that come and go to not killing our relatives, for instance, if you want a nice example, that makes our lives trivial. Um, the desires and the aversions that we need to transcend in order to achieve unity with the divine. Transcending these sources of our own suffering and confusion requires us to recognize our finitude as the source of the problem and to transcend it in a kind of infinite unity with the cosmos itself. 
in Job, we saw that it's our inability to understand the universe that causes this kind of experience of the world as simply awful. But a coming to grips with our finitude in the context of an infinite universe that allows us the kind of acceptance that permits us to lead a meaningful life in a universe that's fundamentally incomprehensible. But in either case, the problem is set by the recognition of our finitude in the context of an infinite reality, in this case, an infinite divinity, and in fact, an infinitely incomprehensible divinity. The Stoics and the Epicureans saw the whole problem of the meaning of life as faced by our recognition of the fact that when we examine the universe, it is temporally infinite in the past, temporally infinite in the future, spatially infinite, at least for all practical purposes, and that we constitute such a tiny piece of the whole. The solution to the question of the meaning of life for the Stoics and the Epicureans alike consists in coming to terms with that fact, with the fact that we are really very small in the whole, and the coming to terms involves understanding the relationship that even a very small part has to a very complex whole. Finally, Buddhism frames the whole problem of suffering in terms of our own impermanence and subject to external causes and conditions and the inevitability of our death with all of the anxiety that that brings in train. So again, for Buddhism, it's the recognition of our causal and temporal finitude in the context of this vast array of conditioned existence um, that causes suffering and an understanding of why that involves us as being a part of a larger whole and the responsibilities that implicates that gives us the possibility of leading a meaningful life in that context. Spontaneity. This may have been the surprise that there's so much emphasis on spontaneity in these texts. The Gita, as we've seen, valorizes non-attached action, action that is made possible by a recognition of our union with the divine. As Krishna says to Arjuna, you know, don't worry about the consequences, don't think, just act. Pick up that bow and fight. This is a kind of spontaneity that arises as a consequence in the Gita of the cultivation of these three yogas. So it's an achieved spontaneity. We don't get the spontaneity without cultivating the yoga of action, karma yoga, the yoga of knowledge, jnana yoga, and the yoga of devotion, bhakti yoga. But the whole point of that assiduous cultivation is to free ourselves from the immediate impact of desires, attractions, and aversions, and to allow us to act freely, that is spontaneously, with no attachment to the consequences of our actions. So spontaneity emerges in the Gita very quickly. Spontaneity also plays a big role in Aristotle, because as we saw for Aristotle, when we want to distinguish virtuous action from action which may be simply in accordance with virtue, the, the distinction is drawn on the basis of this fact. Virtuous action is chosen for its own sake, out of our character, something that gives us pleasure, something we just want to do. The Confucians really emphasized the importance of the cultivation of spontaneity. And we saw all of the Aristotelian affinities, but with a lot more emphasis than Aristotle on the cultivation of spontaneity in this kind of very refined, polished, um, eloquent uh, propriety and etiquette. The Taoists also valued spontaneity for all that they disagreed with the Confucians. It's just that they valued a, non, a natural spontaneity, not a cultivated spontaneity. They were deeply suspicious of the Confucian view of what spontaneity amounted to, but they agreed with the Confucians completely that the meaningful life is a spontaneous, virtuoso life. And though we didn't emphasize this as much, for the Buddhists, there's an important sense of spontaneity as well. And that comes from the emphasis on non-conceptual engagement with the world as opposed to conceptual engagement. Because as we saw, especially in the Zen tradition, conceptuality is distrusted. Distrusted for some of the same reasons that the Taoists distrusted, but also because conceptuality 
always involves engagement with what's not real, whereas perception brings us into contact with reality, including the reality of our own nature. And so when we stop superimposing all of the conceptual stuff, all the linguistic stuff, we are able to act in response to perception, to simply react, as it were, naturally, as opposed to studiedly. And so we have an element of spontaneity as important in the meaningful life as well. So much for these kind of general, broad kinds of agreement. There's something else that I hope that you've learned as we've taken this tour through the classical world. And that is something about literary style and reading. Now, not every lecture um, that we've had together has been a textual lecture, but many of them have been. And in those textual lectures, I've been very concerned to read with you, as I read in my office with my students on the campuses where I teach. And in doing that, what we've been doing together is examining text and talking about how to extract meaning from it. We've seen texts of various kinds. We've seen epic poetry, as in the Gita. We've seen philosophical poetry, as in Job and in Shantideva's Bodhicharya Avatara. We've seen this intensely first-person meditational journal writing of Marcus Aurelius, amusing parables in Shuangzi, and very careful analytical writing that really sets out the arguments in ferocious, gory detail in Aristotle, and then in a very different, slightly more metaphorical way in the Tao Te Ching. What I've been trying to emphasize with you is that each of these styles of writing requires its own style of reading and reflection. Sometimes our task is to get beyond the metaphor, to get beyond the clever story, to get beyond the image, and to reconstruct the argument that lies behind the text but is not articulated in the text. Sometimes the task is to read the carefully articulated argument that focuses so much on detail and then to extrapolate the big picture that makes sense of that argument and that makes it important. If you keep reading philosophically in the future, it's really important to develop this, these skills. It's really important to know what kind of text one is picking up, how to read it, and to not be satisfied with the ink marks on the page, but to really pay attention to the interpretative task that we are called, called upon to perform when we engage with the text of somebody who is long dead and communicating to us only through these marks on a page. I hope that this is a useful phenomenon for you because we're going to continue doing it as we approach modernity in the next few lectures. So there is a broad unity in this diversity. There's a broad consensus among all of the people we've read, however much there is disagreement, that the meaningful life is the virtuoso life. And that is a life that is to be achieved through both contemplation and practice. That achievement, in turn, requires a confrontation with our own finitude and limitation, our own smallness, and the vastness of the universe in which we live. If we are able to take our finitude seriously and to really get a grasp of the fundamental nature of the universe and to settle that in through cultivation, through meditation, through contemplation, even though it may take effort, that effortless virtuosity of action um, is a possibility, is a goal, is what makes our lives uh, worth living. But it's also worth seeing that we have this kind of agreement, at least a broad agreement, that this virtuoso life to which we aspire as human beings isn't the life of a soloist on stage, but it's the life of an ensemble player. Because the virtuosity we aim to cultivate is a virtuosity in interaction, in social roles, and that's manifested in the effortless and joyful discharge of our social responsibilities. In what follows, we are going to be turning from the ancient to the modern world. One of the things that you may not have noticed so much in the ancient world, but to which I now want to call your attention, is that we've often been looking at ancient traditions, the Aristotelian tradition, the Buddhist tradition, the Taoist tradition, the Confucian tradition, the Hindu tradition, and so forth. And so we've been thinking in terms of these very large social and philosophical movements, even though we've been choosing individual representatives and texts. When we hit modernity, things are going to be different. 
we're going to see much more of an, an emphasis on individuality, free thinking, breaking free of tradition, as opposed to following tradition. Modernity is going to involve a systematic engagement of thought with the new sciences that arise beginning in the 16th and 17th centuries, and with the democratic political ideals, the, refl the respect for individual rights, for individual obligations, and for the need for individuals to develop their own potential in the context of societies. We're going to see a lot of these ideas of democracy, rationality, science, and a rejection of tradition developed in modernity. But at the same time, we are going to see all of these um, rejections, all of these emphases on individuality manifested by taking up in creative new ways and transforming the ideas that emerge from the classical world, both Asian and Western. So in our next lecture, we're going to begin to look at the modernist ideas of David Hume, and we're going to see Aristotelian ideas and sometimes Stoic and skeptic ideas brought into dialogue with science and democracy. Please join me for this tremendous uh, revolution in our thinking that's about to begin.